God, for thy mercy! They are loose again. They come with naked swords. Let us call more help and have them bound again. Oh, wait! They'll kill us. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our channel, Shakespeare Sundays, where every Sunday we dive deep into Shakespearean poetry and plays. I'm Reagan. And I'm Anna, and today we'll be looking into the Comedy of Errors by William Shakespeare. Now, you've already seen a short snippet of the play, which happens to be the climax. It's the climax because there is a ton of confusion in this play between two sets of twins. First, we'll look at some of the events of the play, we'll act out a scene, and then we're going to look into some opinions of the play. First, let's look into our author, William Shakespeare. He was an English poet and playwright. William was born on April 23rd, 1564. He lived in Stratford-upon-Avon and attended Stratford Grammar School. He likely learned Latin, reading, and writing there until he was roughly 15 years of age. In 1582, William married Anne Hathaway, and they had three children and four grandchildren, who all died without child, ending the Shakespeare line. It is estimated that Shakespeare has written about 37 to 40 plays during his time as a writer. This includes about 17 comedies and roughly 154 poems. The Comedy of Errors is assumed to be one of his earliest written plays. It is also one of the shortest and simplest plays that he has ever written. Now that we understand more about the author, let's look a little bit into the Comedy of Errors itself. Stick around because later we will be acting out Act 4, Scene 3 of the play. In order to understand this whirlwind of a play, it is vital to know the characters. Being as there are two sets of twins, it can be really confusing. Let's break it down a little bit. Aegean and his wife were the set of twins. Later, the parents took in another set of twins as slaves. While on a boat trip from Syracuse to Epidamnum, a storm hit, ripping apart the family. The mother with one of each set of twins washed upon Ephesus, assuming the others dead, naming them Antiphilus and Dromeo. Aegean, with another set of twins, washed upon Syracuse, also naming the two Antiphilus and Dromeo. In each place, Ephesus and Syracuse, the three grew up with Antiphilus and Dromeo, not knowing that each of them had another set of twins. Antiphilus of Ephesus soon married a woman named Adriana and became highly respected in Ephesus. Aegean, Antiphilus, and Dromeo of Syracuse soon realized that they wanted to find his wife and set sail to Ephesus, where Aegean was arrested soon after. Later, Adriana mistakes Antiphilus of Syracuse for her husband, Antiphilus of Ephesus. She invited him to supper. When Antiphilus of Ephesus returns home, he's not allowed inside as Adriana believes that he is a random passerby because her husband is upstairs. Antiphilus of Ephesus asked a goldsmith named Angelo for a golden necklace to give to the courtesan to make Adriana jealous. Therefore, Antiphilus of Ephesus and Dromeo of Ephesus go to dinner at the courtesan's house to spite Adriana. While at dinner with the courtesan, Antiphilus of Ephesus retrieves a ring from her. Him and Dromeo then leave. While this is happening, Angelo gives the wrong Antiphilus the golden necklace. Soon, the courtesan would like her ring back, or at least the golden necklace promised to her, by Antiphilus of Ephesus. She stumbles upon Antiphilus and Dromeo of Syracuse, mistaking them for the other two. We will now be performing Act 4, Scene 3 of the Comedy of Errors. Well met, well met, Master Antiphilus. I see, sir, you found the goldsmith now. Is this the chain you promised me today? Satan, avoid, I charge thee, tempt me not. Master, is this Mr. Satan? It is the devil. Nay, she is worse. She is the devil's dam, and here she appear in the habit of a light witch. And there it comes when wenches say, God damn thee. That's as much say, God make me a light wench. It is written, they appear to men like angels of light. And light is an effect of fire, and fire will burn. Ergo, light wenches will burn. Come not near her. You and your man are marvelous merry, sir. Come with me, we'll mend our dinner here. Master, if you do, expect spoon meat or bespeak a long spoon. I drum you. Mary, he who must eat with the devil must have a long spoon. Avoid then, fiend, what tellst me of supping. Thou art, as thou art all, a sorceress. I conjure thee to leave me and be gone. Give me the ring of mine you had at supper, or, for my diamond, the chain you promised me, and I will be gone, sir, not to trouble you. Some devils ask for the parings of one's nail, a rush, a hair, a drop of blood, a pin, a nut, a cherry stone. But she, more covetous, asks for a chain. Master, be wise. And if you give it her, the devil will shake her chain and fright us with it. I pray you, sir, the ring or else the chain. I hope you do not mean to cheat me so. Avant thou witch, come, Dromeo, let us go. Fly pride, says the peacock, mistress that you know. Now, out of doubt, Antiphilus is mad. 
else he would never so demean himself. A ring he hath of mine worth forty ducats, and the same he promised me a chain. Both one and the other he denies me now. The reason that I gather he is mad, besides this present instance of his rage, is the mad tale he told today at dinner of his own doors being shut against his entrance. Be like his wife, acquainted with his fits, uh, on his purpose shut his doors against his way. My way is now to his home, to his house, and tell his wife that, being lunatic, he rushed into my house and took perforce my ring away. This course I fit as choose, for forty ducats is too much to lose. After this confrontation, the courtesan is left feeling insane and confused. Soon after, Adriana brings her husband and the slave to an exorcist by the name of Dr. Pinch, pledging that they're insane. He says that Antiphilus of Ephesus is mad and takes him and Dromio of Ephesus into custody. The two from Syracuse see Adriana and her sister and draw their swords on them, causing the angry and scared conflict as seen in the beginning of our episode. When the officers arrive, the two from Syracuse escape to the abbey and meet the abbess. Adriana, thinking her husband and slave escaped Dr. Pinch, tries to get the abbess to let them go. After, the abbess says no, and Adriana goes to the duke to force their release from the abbess, while Aegean is in the trial from the beginning. The abbess and the two from Syracuse are brought to the trial, right as the two from Ephesus also show up. The abbess reveals herself as the mother of the Antipholuses and the husband of Aegean. The two sets of twins realize they are brothers, and the people of Ephesus realize that they aren't insane. Aegean gets released, and the family is reunited. Shakespeare now includes a line that reads, We came into the world like brother and brother, and now let's go hand in hand, not one before another. We chose to portray Act 4, Scene 3 of the play because we thought it exemplified many interactions between many people. The courtesan and Antiphilus of Syracuse had a lot of confusion and resentment in their conversation. In almost every scene, there was a similar confrontation because of the mixed identities. It's important to recognize that this is the first time someone besides the sets of twins thought that they were going mad because of this confusion. This proves the effects that the twins had on the city and the city causing much insanity in many people. While this play caused much confusion to its readers, many people love it because of its overarching themes. The first theme that can be seen is that of family. This play proves how the lack of family can cause loneliness, isolation, and even insanity. The main peril of this play revolves around characters trying to regain family or to maintain it. The resolution only comes once the family is reunited, which proves that possible solutions come easier with family. Another major theme of this play is identity. Characters were so certain as to who they were arguing against that it made it very difficult for the twins to even understand their own true identity. We believe that Shakespeare was trying to prove the importance of identifying yourself to others in order to combat miscommunication. We would also suggest that Shakespeare was trying to exemplify the value of uniqueness and your differences. Today we are joined by Bob Corbett, a modern philosopher who writes uh, critiques on different books and articles. So let's see what he has to say about the comedy of errors. In my humble opinion, I do believe that this was a wonderful play, but one small problem that I find with it is that both of the twins would not be wearing the same clothing. Clearly, Antiphilus of Syracuse and Antiphilus of Ephesus would not be wearing the same article of clothing, which makes it confusing as to how no character seemed to notice a difference between them, when obviously there should be. So that is my one small problem, but overall, I think this was an amazing play with exquisite features. We also read a blog from a play critic by the name of Kirk Shepard. Let's see what he had to say. Shepard stated, It is anything but boring, in fact. I left after the show feeling completely satisfied, which, if I'm being honest, has never happened following a Shakespearean play on stage anywhere. Shepard goes on to say, Things break down into pure mayhem until there's a wonderful resolution at the end where everyone leaves happy, including the audience. After doing research about professional critics and their opinions, it is seen that the comedy of errors is one that has lots of physical humor and can be the source of laughter if well executed. This is a very exciting play that keeps the audience on their toes and ensures confusion, which resolves into a touching ending. I personally really enjoyed this play. I really liked how Shakespeare seemed to focus on the value of family, uniqueness, and identity. 
He used tons of puns, jokes, and even slapstick humor, which is way before his time, and it was super funny. I think it is necessary for readers to read it or to go and watch it because it's light of heart and it encourages laughter in the audience. In my opinion, this was a very well-written play. It exemplifies creativity beyond humor, and it was one of Shakespeare's earliest written plays, so it's awesome to see his playwriting develop. The confusing nature of this play adds to its character, and the resolution leaves the audience feeling with love for their family. All right, guys, that's all for today's Shakespeare Sunday. Make sure to tune in next week when we look into A Midsummer's Night Dream. Bye! Bye.